Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. I woke up today with every design of going into our normal kind of, not a Monday recap necessarily, because we're still in the off season, but a Monday look back at what we talked about on Friday, what's going on with the ADPs of different guys. Shout out to my good buddy Andre for updating our ADP tracker. And then, as I was coming back from dropping off our our smaller kid at a little house pod play day kind of thing, because he's still preschool age and his preschool doesn't start until uh, Thursday of this week. Very exciting for me, by the way. Summer break is almost officially fully over in the Vespers household. But as I was coming back home, I thought, you know, there's something, there's a conceptual thing that I've been wanting to go over on the podcast for a long time, and I hadn't really figured out when made the most sense to do it. Because it's not about picking the actual name that is to say, we're going to talk a little bit about sleepers today, but we're not going to talk about actual individual players this year that I think are going to be sleepers. Instead, we're going to talk about the, the concept of how to handicap a sleeper versus what we do often on this show, what you guys all, and we, we've turned it into kind of a silly thing, but the Dan Vespers old man squad is not a sleeper list. It never has been. So today, we're going to talk about the old man squad versus the concept of a sleeper. And then, how to isolate the sleeper handicap. Because it's very different than the old man handicap. First of all, welcome to the show. It's Monday. Off-season episode 111, yikes, of Fantasy NBA Today. I'm your host, Dan Bespris. Handful of you are starting to follow on Twitter. That's how I know there are some new listeners trickling in. We're almost in the middle of September. We are not that far away from the one-month mark. I think it's Sunday. It's coming Sunday is the one-month mark. Yeah, October 18th, September 18th. So we are very much coming down the chute. Tomorrow is the five-week mark from the start of the NBA season, so you know it's getting close. When I can put the week numbers as a single-digit monster, and not even, I mean, we're, we're really coming up on it. So I'm excited to get rolling today with a concept that I've been kind of waiting to deploy and trying to, tell, you know, I decided to go with the today's as good a time as any. Uh, please do, if you're a new listener, follow me on Twitter at Dan Bespris, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S, or just Google search Dan from HoopBall, even though this is a sports ethos presentation, because search engines seem to still think that I am linked to our old website. I will tell you more about the draft guide as we get to the middle of the show, because the Brewski 150 is not that far away now. We've had more new stuff added to the draft guide, but again, that will be coming at the midpoint of today's podcast. There isn't a perfect way to present this set of topics, this idea of the old man squad versus the sleeper. But I think because we've done so much old man squad talk over the years, we probably need to start there. What does it mean to be not necessarily a member of the Dan Vespers old man squad, but just to be kind of even in the consideration? Effectively, you don't have to be a super old player, you just kind of have to have no buzz. So a more accurate name for the Dan Bespris Old Man Squad would be the Dan Bespris Super Boring Player Squad, but that doesn't spell D-bombs. Old Man Squad, Dan Bespris Old Man Squad does. That acronym is much more fun. But you'll get players like Robert Williams last year, who's very much not an old man, but he's got old man knees, and his fantasy game profiles more as a an old man type of game. So he ends up as kind of an old man squad kind of dude in seasons past. Not as much this year, but still a little bit. And the, the list goes on like that, where on the flip side, someone like Chris Paul has been a member of the old man squad basically because he's been very old. 
So it, it does go both ways. Okay, next question that needs to be answered is, what actually entails old man fantasy relevance? Well, this is where you kind of have to pivot back into the Dan Basper super boring player squad because it's about having players that are not typically super high scoring. Chris Paul scored just 15 points a game last year. Robert Williams just 10 points a game last year. Sometimes you can inch your way up into that 20 range, but very rarely will you get above that. If you are, it's like squeezing over 20. I would say 22 is probably kind of your barrier in general, but for a couple of one-offs. Guys like DeMar DeRozan, who scored 28, but did it in a different way. So typically, it's about 22 points or less. Generally, much less than that, but trying to give a little bit of leeway. Generally, the old man squad type of players are good in categories that are often overlooked, particularly on the roto side. Well, particularly on the head-to-head side, but on both. But in the roto side where they are, I would argue, more valuable because winning three or four lesser-focused categories is a delightful way to rack up roto points without as much competition. So things like steals, less so, but blocks, more so. Field goal percent, maybe the most. Field goal percent is probably the least accounted for statistic in all of fantasy sports. Free throw percent, turnovers. Those five are kind of your old man categories. Assists are a hard no as far as like what constitutes. I know you're like Dan, you just talked about Chris Paul, but it's not a focused thing. Like, you're not hunting assists with old man types. Those guys tend to be more buzzy on average. Threes, you're generally not hunting because they tend to go a little bit hand-in-hand with scoring. So old man squad guys generally are better at steals, blocks, both percentages, and turnovers. And then there's sort of like some stuff elsewhere, depending on what type of player they are, how old they are, things of that nature. So like a Time Lord... Very good in field goal percent. Actually, relatively decent in free throw, considering he's a traditional big man. Free throw percent isn't great, but it doesn't take many. Good in turnovers, good in steals for a big guy, great in blocks, good in rebounds. You're just kind of getting that as a side bonus. So those are old man squad characteristics, or rather, boring player characteristics. It's why for so many years, someone like a Tobias Harris just kept popping up on our board over and over. Not not so much this year. Remember, not so much this year. He's in a much worse scenario. But looking at the last few seasons, he's been somewhere between 17 and 20 points for the most part. Not much in the way of rebounds, not much in the way of assists. Actually, steals and blocks weren't that great for him either. But good percentages in both, low turnovers, extremely reliable, and kind of just enough in points, threes, boards, assists, to cover up for the fact that he didn't really block any shots and didn't get a ton of steals. The blocks, I guess, are okay for a a forward type. He's, like, right around league average there. So that's why someone like Tobias Harris was an old man squad guy for so long. And he's not alone. I mean, we've seen these types of guys. Mikael Bridges, who's not old, but is an old man squad player because he's very good in assists, Not as good in blocks. Terrific in both percentages and turnovers. There are limitations to the old man squad. I've had people send me pictures of their draft. or like, hey, what do you think about my old man team? And usually I'm like, well, I like a lot of the names on it. But it does actually kind of segue back to a point very similar to one we made late last week. And that point was, hey, you can take shots on injured players in Roto Games Cap formats... But you probably shouldn't take a shot on all of the injured players because at some point you're not going to be able to field the team. There's a, there's like a, a, I guess, decreasing returns type of deal on this where the more risk you put on that injury side, the more likely it is to really burn you. In a similar way, if you drafted all old man squad team, it actually might work better in head-to-head than Roto all of a sudden because in Roto, you're not going to have many points at all. It's why I often end up accidentally punting points. You're probably not going to have a ton of three-pointers. Your assists are probably going to suffer a little bit, unless you have Chris Paul, because he's kind of the one 
old man assist guy on that board. You're probably going to be pretty damn good in steals, blocks, percentages, and turnovers, but you can't be that bad in scoring and threes and maybe assists and still win your Roto League. There has to be other things going on in your fantasy team besides just old men. And if you're kind of looking at the board this year, I guess one way you could rectify that would be at the beginning of a draft. If you know you're going to be hunting old men in rounds three through eight or whatever, at the beginning of the draft, you're like, okay, well, what am I definitely going to be suffering for? I need points. I need assists. I need threes. I need uh, my volume guy to also have decent percentages so that I can build upon that. So someone obviously, like if you had a, a top pick, Kevin Durant would make a lot of sense. Joel Embiid would be a really nice grab there because his percentages are solid. Uh, someone like Cat, although that doesn't help you as a ton in assists. Even if you want James Harden, you could probably make up for the field goal percent elsewhere. You have to make sure that your first pick covers what the old man squad team isn't going to do for you later. But the overall idea on old man squad team is these are guys who just happen to get pushed down the draft board because they're not as exciting. It's as easy as that. And it doesn't really matter if they're old. It just happens to be that when they're old, this occurs more frequently. So we can give it a silly name because a player like Chris Paul is going to be farther down the board than he should be every year, simply because we know he's not about to get better. People love to draft the shiny thing that's just about to get better. They love it. It's everything happening between picks 45 and 65 this year, and plenty of the of similar names sort of pockmarked through the first 45. It's just that a lot of these guys are sort of mushed into one little area. But everybody loves to look towards the front end of a draft and grab the guy who's getting better. That's very hard to do in the first round because the names are so established. It's pretty damn hard to do in the second round for the same reason. But by the time you get to the late second, early third, you've got names that have crept in there where people are then drafting them at their ceiling. Or even above their ceiling. Like if we're talking about a John Morant who's moving down the board as we speak, but... He was a guy where he was ranked based on a place he's never been before in fantasy. It does happen. It's not as many as, as, as you work your way through, but like LaMelo Ball, yes, by totals he's been there, but let's be honest. Like, if I say, oh, LaMelo Ball is ADP is 11, and I'm like, look, he's never been that high... What I'm talking about is on a per-game basis. He was number 21 per game last year. If somebody's drafting him at 11 this year, they're not doing it because he was durable last season. They're not. Because if you're taking a pick at 11, you're looking for a guy who has the ability to be number 11 on a per-game basis. That's just the way it works. It's accepted. Yes, totals matter. I've argued for that for the entirety of this podcast existence. But people aren't drafting... Us often as well. We don't do it either. People don't draft in the first round based on whether the, someone can barely get to the point that they're drafted by totals. They want folks that can exceed that, perhaps because of totals or perhaps because of per game. But you get these guys, and I don't want this to come off like I'm talking down on any of the players I'm mentioning here, other than perhaps John Morant, who, you know, even the biggest Jaw fans in the world know that he doesn't belong here on a, a roto draft board. But most of the guys that creep up too far are the exciting names. Anthony Edwards has been on the rise. DeJounte Murray fell, and now he's back on the rise again. Which is cool, because he did do it last year, but, you know, new situation. And then Devin Booker. His ADP is now higher than he was last year, which felt almost like as good as it could have gotten. And I actually really liked what Booker did last season. In fact, he profiles like kind of a mended old man type of player, but he does score too much for that. But good percentages actually cover up a lack in some other things. All that to say, and I don't have like six or seven names in the top 25. You don't need six or seven names in the top 25. You only need a few. All you need is a few, and that creates the beginnings of the old man. 
the old men on the draft board, even in the early part, are guys that just fell because other guys were more interesting. Even LeBron kind of falls into the old man department now. And some guys fall for reasons. Injury, fear, Dame, Anthony Davis, Paul George, Jimmy Butler, Kawhi Leonard, Freddie Van Vliet. Eh, less so there, but still sort of. You can put it on reasons other than just general boredom. But it does still kind of feel the same. Like, there isn't that big of a reason for some of those names to be as far down as they are, other than guys just aren't really interested in rostering them. There's a fun of roster element in fantasy that we go the opposite direction in. The Dan Vesper's boring team player squad is the non-fun team. We're the fun police in the fantasy world. Everybody else is drafting teams that they think are going to be fun, and we let all those fun guys go off the board and get other dudes that are just going to outperform their ADP. Because they just ended up getting drafted six slots, 12 slots too late. Because other, more interesting players moved in front of them. That concept is pretty straightforward. But I think the idea of the sleeper is actually a little bit of a tougher one to quantify necessarily. But not that hard to qualify. As of about 10 years ago, and I kind of want to go back on this discussion uh, because I do think it needs a little bit of um, history. Eh, It's not true history. It's more anecdotal history, I guess, but whatever. Either way, look, this is the midway point, and then I forgot to mention to you guys. You guys got to go check out the Fantasy Pass and the Sports Ethos Draft Guide at sportsethos.com. New items in the Draft Guide that I promised I would tell you about as they go in there. Mike Passador. One of, if not the greatest, fantasy writer on planet Earth and uh, 30 deep winner, I think, two years ago, uh, put together a draft season review of last year's sleepers and last year's busts articles so you know how Sports Ethos is handicapping for these things and how they generally do. In addition, other things you can find in the draft guide right now. A Cash Counters Club article on guys that are great at threes, steals, and blocks. Factor Fiction articles, two of them listing more than 31 players from last year that either had breakout or subpar performances and whether those things are going to continue. Second Half Sensations, a fantastic article from Eric Ong, one of our longtime writers here and editors at Sports Ethos that goes through guys that broke out at the end of last year and whether that's going to continue. So that's kind of a little bit of a sleepers article with a different name. We've got a beginner's series. From Jameson, if you're just getting started, team previews from the entire staff over there. That goes through on minute-per-game projections. We've got over 300 player profiles. That will swell all the way to eight, basically every player in the NBA by the time this thing is done. Mike is, is crazy with that stuff. We've also got a schedule grid, a streaming tool, an ADP tracker, and more. Coming this week, we add two to three things almost every couple of days in that draft guide. It's going to be ridiculous by the time it's done. It's already nuts. Go check it out at sportsethos.com. If I had my druthers, you guys would all get fantasy passes so you can hang out with our pros, myself included, throughout the season as part of the in-season package as well. And, and, and the Brewski 150. Coming soon to Ethos 360 subscribers. They get it before anybody else. Ten days after Ethos 360, the Fantasy Pass gets it, and then five days after that, it gets inserted into the regular draft guide. So if you want the B150 earlier than anybody, get yourself an Ethos 360 membership. That includes the uh, wagering package and DFS, or get a Fantasy Pass. That gets the B150 ten days before the season starts. So we are coming down the chute on all of that good stuff. SpeedSportsEthos.com, the website. Check it out right now and get your premium product today. There's actually a massive, hideous advertisement that I designed right on the homepage. You go to SportsEthos.com. Very hard to miss. (laughs) I decided to go with like one of the ugliest in-your-face designs I could possibly come up with. And that's what it is. Okay, I want to get back to this idea of finding the sleeper. 
And we're not going to find one on today's podcast, so don't get overly excited. This show is about how it's done. And the funny thing is that I don't feel like analysts as a whole have really figured out how to abide by this formula. And that's not anybody's fault. It's really more of a short-term memory loss kind of thing where then we go through the same song and dance every year. Myself included, by the way. I'm not trying to throw stones on this one. I'm, uh, my house is very much made of glass, so when I throw these stones, it shatters my house. The, the idea is that to find a sleeper in the modern fantasy analysis universe... You really only need to look at two things. What do I always say on this podcast? We're here to simplify fantasy basketball. There are two ways to do uh, fantasy analysis on this earth. There is make it look really complicated, like a, a beautiful mind type of wall, and then just have an answer for somebody. And then they look at the wall and they're like, well, I'm never going to figure out how to do that. I'm just going to look for you for the answer. The other way is the one that I hope we've been doing on the podcast. It's what I've been striving to try to do for you guys, which is simplify the game. Simplify the game and make it so that you can do this fantasy analysis on your own without me. I mean, obviously, I'd prefer you continue to listen to the show because that's good for our bottom line. But at the end of every year of this pod, I'm hoping most of you feel like you could do it. So, sure, you can go through every damn name in the NBA and spend 30, 40, 50 hours handicapping every single one of their likely productions, and maybe a couple of sleepers will rise to the top of that bunch. But at the end of the day, to find a sleeper now, you really only need to be looking at two things, which is, one, who might surprise us with more minutes than we expected. Or two, and maybe I should have listed them in the opposite order, because this one's probably the bigger one. Two, you know what, screw it. Let's start this list over. I'm not even going to edit that out. One, this is the most important. Who's going to surprise us with more usage than we expect? Going into draft season. Where most folks have written them off, for not having enough usage, but then they just magically get more. Two, you can actually roll minutes into usage if you want. Two is who gets better at percentages, or is better at percentages, either gets or is, that we didn't see coming. That's it. You'm sure you can go back through the last five years and find me a sleeper that doesn't fit either of those two criteria, but I would argue that 90% or more of them do. And just looking at this past season, it, by the way, it's hard to say like who the sleepers were last year, but what I would say is this. It's guys that generally had an ADP later than 90 or 100, And then ended up with value inside the top 50. Not by totals, more per game. I'm thinking more per game here. So, you know, it's not a guy that just happens to be extraordinarily durable and is number 75. That's also useful. Like, don't get me wrong. Someone drafted at 100 and whatever uh, and finishes at 75 on a per game basis. That's still a, a pretty nice little hit. Like, Herb Jones would qualifies that last year Josh Hart before he got shut down was getting drafted ultra late and finished in the mid 70s they pop up Larry Markkinen falls into that group last year those guys were all very useful in fact you could even extend it into the 80s if you wanted to although there weren't many names that were drafted super late and once you get into the 80s these are guys that are actually not really moving the boulder forward for your fantasy team The guys that moved the boulder forward this last year started at about pick 65. So you're looking at guys that were drafted after 100 that had a per-game ranking of 65 or higher. So at least three rounds of value, preferably more. And the names that became that 
this last year, and this is not a, a fully comprehensive list, but I think it's most of them, were Jordan Poole, Scotty Barnes. Do you want to put Bobby Portis in there? I'm going to say no, because his a lot of his production was because Brooke Lopez went down. Tyrese Maxey is absolutely on that list. Mo Bamba would have been, but he started going in the 80s and 90s right before the season started. So late drafts, Bamba was going earlier. But if you want to, you can put him on there because I'd rather have more names now to analyze than less. So uh, just to recap, Poole, Barnes, Maxi, Bamba. We can keep going. Gary Trent Jr. was number five on this list. Desmond Bain, Miles Bridges, Terry Rozier. That's probably it. And Miles Bridges is iffy because he was going in the 80s and 90s in a lot of drafts too. So Bridges is iffy, Bamba is iffy, but if we include every name that we could think of, of guys that were drafted, like if we're going to include late 80s, early 90s, then that adds those extra two names, and then finished inside the top 65, it's basically those eight guys, more or less. Rob Covington is sort of like right on the periphery there. We'll say no, I think he was getting drafted early enough. We'll say no on Rocco. So of those eight names, can we say that they fall into either of the two categories that I listed, which is someone ended up with way more usage than was expected due to their ADP and pre-rank, or ended up with way better percentages, or both? I think the answer might be yes on all eight of them. Scotty Barnes had much higher usage than we all thought. He ended up taking 13 shots and three free throws and three and a half assists per ball game, and shot 49% from the field. So I would argue he might actually fall into both of those categories. Jordan Poole, way higher usage than we figured, and I think he led the league in free throw percent last year. So he kind of falls into both. Tyrese Maxey, very much both great percentages and extra usage. And if you even thought he was going to get the usage, I don't think you thought he was going to get the percentages. Mo Bamba, more usage than was expected, is probably the answer there. Played 26 minutes a game, got nine shots, was out there long enough to do damage. And if you want to say Bamba didn't really get more usage than you expected, that's fine because he was a guy we included as kind of a maybe anyway because he was getting drafted in the 80s and 90s. Gary Trent, that's an easy one. Way more usage than anyone expected. Took almost 16 shots a game. Desmond Bain, same story. Way better usage than anybody expected. Took 15, almost 15 shots a game. And then Miles Turner, who's another one, or Miles Bridges, excuse me, who, look, I don't want to talk about him too much because he's in very hot water right now. Uh, but he was kind of both. Although he was a carryover because he was playing really well at the end of the previous season. So, Again, like Mo Bamba, he was getting drafted earlier than these other names I listed. Um, but very much better percentages and probably more usage. And you're, I know what you're saying. You're like, this sounds so obvious in retrospect. But if you look back at a lot of the names that were getting drafted past 100 last year, a lot of those guys were not players that were expected to have, or like you could say, this is a guy I might surprise me with their uh, percentages or their usage. In fact, look at Yahoo's pre-rank list right now, starting at pick 80, and tell me how many of these guys you look at and you're like, this is a guy who could explode with more usage or better percentages than I expect. I'm going to rattle off names. I'm going to list off about 45 players here. Don't get too caught up in the, the, the individual names, but we're, we're kind of looking. Apologies. Uh, it was brought to my attention that I did a big Ace Ventura breath on a recent show, but then didn't do the, uh, the Ray Finkel monologue. So maybe we'll do that now. Zubats Bay, Jamal Murray, Buddy Heald, Mitchell Robinson, Isaiah Jackson, Herb Jones, Keegan Murray, Mo Bamba, Jalen Smith, Marcus Smart, Lonzo Ball, Ben Simmons, Russell Westbrook, P.J. Washington, Devin Vassell, Jabari Smith Jr., Brandon Clark, Gary Trent Jr., Andrew Wiggins, Kyle Lowry. Unfortunately, I can't go farther because I have to wait for another page to load. But that was 80 through 100. And then 100 through 125 
We'll finish off the deep breath. Portis, Simons, Kuzma, Gordon Hayward, Al Horford, Rocco, Jaron Jackson Jr., Anyako Kongwu, Kevin Porter, Miles Bridges, Isaiah Stewart, Nick Claxton, Josh Hart, Isaiah Hartenstein, Jared Vanderbilt, Jalen, or is that Jaden? Nope, Jalen McDaniels, Harrison Barnes, Monty Morris, Cole Anthony, Malcolm Brogdon, Brooke Lopez, Larry Markin, and Mark L. Fultz, Mike Conley, and Trey Jones. This is a spot where it's very easy, particularly in the first 20 names that I listed, to go with the safe play. And I'm okay with that because there are enough names between 80 and 100 that have safe fantasy appeal with a little bit of upside that you can go that direction. Of the names that I just rapid-fired off to you, if Buddy Heald doesn't get traded before the season starts, he's got some nice upside in Indiana. Mitchell Robinson, same story. Uh, my Isaiah Jackson, there's more buzz around that one. If you wanted to go that... Look, I'm not going to try to talk you out of these guys. I'm just going to say, like, Heald, Mitch Robb, uh, Brandon Clark, who's... That's a different thing, I guess. Gary Trent Jr., who's down there. Kyle Lowry, who's down there. Like, there are four or five names. Mo Bamba. These are more established fantasy plays. Jamal Murray is an established one. Sorry, I looped back around to some names that I missed. Marcus Smart's an established one. You've got some names in there that you would never touch, like Russell Rest, R- 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 <laughs> Lonzo Ball. I can speak, I promise. Zubots, there's no upside there. And then you've got like the younger, more fun ones, like Isaiah Jackson, Jalen Smith, Keegan Murray, uh, Devin Vassell. P.J. Washington is still kind of a younger guy. So if you wanted to go the younger route, if you wanted to go the I think I can find a sleeper route, you need to ask yourself, is this a player that could blow me away with usage much higher than what the Yahoo projection suggests it might be? Because they have those listed now. Yahoo's got their projections up, so that's telling you why they have these players listed where they are. So take um, Devin Vassell, for instance. He's projected to have about 203 pointers, play in 76 games. I wonder if I can get projections on an average basis. I can't, so I would have to do that math myself. If they think he's going to play in 76 games, here's the very fuzzy math. Uh, 76 goes into that. So they think, it's not great math by me right here. Um, he's like five rebounds a game, two-ish assists per game, one, one and just a very little over one steal, about half a block, uh, just over one turnover per game. The only thing I wasn't able to do in my head there was, uh, 1355 divided by 76, which 76 would go into 15, 20, 20 times. So take away about two of those. So they got him at like 18 points. There, I got to it. See, don't don't worry. The math was eventually there. So that's what they have there. So if you think that any of those numbers that I just gave you on a Devin Vassell are going to be substantially better than what you're what you just heard, that would be a reason to go earlier. So 18 points per game. That's a pretty high projection, actually. 44% from the field, 85 at the free throw line. 18 points, 5-ish rebounds, 18, 5, and 2 with a steal and half a block. Does kind of put you in... I mean, to me, that sounds better than like mid-80s to late to early 90s, but, you know, whatever. But do you think that's the kind of player that could maybe take a step forward in something? Is it going to be usage or is it going to be percentages? Because his percentages were worse than that last year. Devin Vassell was at 43% from the field and 84% at the foul line. He was, by the way, uh, number 92 on a per-game basis last season with 12 points, two threes, four boards, two assists, Almost the same steals, blocks, free throw, and turnovers that they've got him projected for this season. So I guess it's a little surprising that he's at 95, but again, some of that is because they've got these weirdo 8-cat and points league dudes slotted in in front of him that maybe aren't 
as big a factor. But just on those numbers alone, I, you know, I think you're looking at a guy who's well ahead of that slot. And if his usage goes higher from there, that's a guy that maybe you say, oh, this guy could qualify. Okay. What about a little bit later on? Well, once you get past pick 100, by the way, this isn't me saying Devin Vassell is your magical sleeper. I'm just saying this is how you have to look at the Yahoo board. Once you get past pick 100, the idea of the sort of safe, this guy will definitely get me good fantasy value for the season picks evaporate. What did I say? There were like six or seven out of 20 names between 80 and 100. That's a pretty good hit rate on safe old man types between 100 and 125 i don't know if you remember any of the names i just listed off first of all larry marketing is in there he's gonna go earlier than this post trade so just yank him out of that bunch leaving who al horford is a pretty safe one in there because he's look he's still gonna have his role in boston uh if gordon hayward is healthy he would qualify but in head-to-head there's a reason he's going this low and it's because he's expected to play yeah, who's got him listed at only 54 ball games on the year. So that's why he's down there. Brooke Lopez is down there as a safe play. And then Mike Conley's down there because no one knows what team he's going to be on at the start of the season. Otherwise, those 25 names are pretty much all take a shot type of guys. So when you look through that list, and when you look through you know 126 through 150 on the Yahoo board, or if you're going to look even farther than that, you're looking for the names of guys who can produce a better set of percentages or a much higher usage rate than what Yahoo has listed in their projections. Do you think Monte Morris, they've got him playing almost every game all season long, shooting 47% from the field and 87 at the free throw line. Do you think he's going to outperform those percentages? I doubt it. Do you think he could outperform the other metrics? Yeah, they don't have him taking many shots per game. Only nine. So is he a guy you take a shot on and say, well, you know what? They've got him taking nine shots a game. What if I ratchet that up to a dozen? What does that do? Okay, that makes some sense. So this is what I want you guys to do with that list if you are hunting sleepers. What I don't want you to do is to look at that list and say... Is this guy someone that has a safe floor? Because as we talked about going through these mock drafts, by the end of round nine, which is pick 108, there ain't anybody left that's safe. At that point, you are exclusively drafting guys that you think blow the roof off in either percentages or usage as compared to where they are listed on Yahoo's board. That's it. It is not that hard to narrow down your list of potential sleepers. It's not. Because a lot of guys come off the board here that have no chance of doing either of those two things. RJ Barrett's usage is not going any higher and his percentages are not going any higher. Sorry. He's on the board because of non-nine category leagues, but also... That's it. Dorian Finney-Smith, his percentages and his usage, they're not going anywhere. Now, he might end up being near the top 90, which makes him a really good pick at 134. But if you're looking for a true sleeper, someone picked in this range between 90 and 150 or 90 to the end of the draft, you are looking for someone who can obliterate their expectations in either usage or percentages. That's it. And tomorrow, we're going to go through the updated ADPs to find out if any guys like that are moving up or down the board, as well as what's going on near the top of the draft. Hope that was somewhat enlightening. I think that was kind of an important thing to do, because now you can, like to me, starting in your ninth, 10th round pick, I think you can change the way that you make these selections. Don't take the backup with a good fantasy stat set that you hope is going to get to like 23 minutes per game. Take the starter or take the shot in the dark guy who, yeah, when you look at him, you're like, okay, I'm not that excited about Bones Highland this year. I've said that on the podcast, but he does, he profiles as that kind of guy or it's like, oh, crap, like, look at Bones. He just got an extra two and a half, three shots more per game than we thought. 
By the way, there are going to be better names. I, I, like, I, please, the takeaway from this show is not go draft Devin Vassell and Bones Highland. I'm just saying these are the types of guys you have to look at and say, could they outperform these projections by a bunch in either of two things? Which is funny, too, because we're kind of taking stats set off the board other than just percentages. Because the other stuff you know. That other stuff doesn't change much. Have a wonderful Monday, everybody. I am Dan Vespers at Dan Vespers on Twitter. Go get a fantasy pass before I have to hum, come hunt you down tomorrow. Again, we'll dive back into the ADP and the number stuff. But today, all theory. Enjoy it. 111 off-season episodes done. 112. Ooh.